Hello and welcome or welcome back to Noggin Comics. Uh, today we're actually being joined by a creator who has a Kickstarter uh, coming up soon. Uh, you may know him as Dismay uh, Comics, but uh, I want to introduce to you everybody, Brandon. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be on. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm glad you come on to the channel. Uh, I think we've been following each other some, for some time now on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Through, through Instagram as well as like the various comic book YouTube channels and all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, for those who don't know you, who uh, haven't you know joined, haven't fa haven't gone to your Instagram page yet, or even joined the Kickstarter of book two, who is Dismay Comics and who is Brandon? So, Dismay Comics, Brandon, uh, I I grew up loving comics. Basically, I, I got a a shoebox full of comics from a yard sale. And that kind of sparked it from there back when I was like seven or eight years old, kind of sparked that, uh, sparked a love that I didn't realize till high school for writing. Um, I, I enjoyed writing as, as high school went along to where I wasn't an amazing writer in high school, but this did like encourage me somewhat in my English, uh, comp one class in 11th grade my teacher at the end of the year gave me a reward for most improved in writing <laughs> so i i could have sucked at the very beginning and then by the end i could have sucked a little less so uh, uh that's that's where that was but uh no I, i've enjoyed writing for a long time and and got into uh, screenwriting, like screenplay writing as a hobby. Um, and eventually it transitioned into to comic writing, which uh, from screenplay writing to comic writing, not a hard transition. There is a transition there, but not that hard. Um, and yeah, around 2019 is when I kind of got a little bit more serious about that hobby with comic making. I, I hired artists uh, to work on various stories and stuff like that as well as that's when i came up with the disney comics name but really it spawned from disney avenue which is a horror anthology that will eventually one day see the light of day um i'm excited it took me forever <laughs> thank you thank you yeah, yeah. It, it took me forever to come up with the name of that one because it, it's inspired by a lot of horror stuff i love horror um, it's, it's, it's inspired by the name is inspired by like classic child horror books. I would read like fear street, um, RL Stein's fear street, but you go back to those books. Now they're not that good, but I've always loved the name fear street. Um, and so that's kind of how eventually I got to the name Disney Avenue. But with that whole series, there's a lot of like twilight zone influence. Because I, I love the Twilight Zone. Um, the new series, it's okay. I, I do like the the classic Rod Zerling one, though. But uh, but yeah, so eventually, basically, I came up with that comic idea and came up with that name. And like a DC Comics type thing, I was like, uh, the book is called Disney Avenue. Okay, uh, 10 seconds. I need to think of... A, a uh, publishing name or a brand name, Disney Comics. There. That, that's basically how Disney Comics came about. But you can't have that DC logo. <laughs> no, no. No, I have to spell it out, Disney <laughs> Comics. Even when, whenever I'm doing a podcast or anything like that with my buddy, at the end when we're like plugging stuff, I always have to say Disney Comics. That's D I S M A Y Comics. Because for some people, it may sound like I'm saying Disney comics Disney, yeah. in a weird way. So I have to very specify that name. Yeah, when I told the girlfriend I was doing the interview with you, she was like, did you say Disney comics? I'm like, Disney comics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. And going back to the podcast, uh, what's the name of that? Is it Store Brand Comics? Yeah, Store Brand Comics. Uh, me and a buddy of mine, uh, we... I met him in college. We basically played 
D and D with each other for a long time. And then we made this podcast because none of our other friends talk about comics or anything like that, or, or really care about writing or anything. So it was kind of our creative outlet for geeking out about comics stuff going on, or this is most of the podcasts like pitching like comic ideas or stuff like that. Cause that's what a lot of it is. It's, it's just random. Sometimes like very interesting. It's like, Hey, Marvel or DC do this idea or very stupid ideas. <laughs> like uh, uh, we had like a fat Albert takes over the world or whatever. It was, it was a crazy idea that popped up one day, but it's, it's a variety of stuff. Hey, I would totally read that one actually. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually just scump, uh, stumbled upon your podcast while doing research earlier today. So, oh, really? You know, that's awesome. that I'm actually subscribed to the channel. <laughs> thank so. you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so you said you got a little shoebox for comics to get you into the journey. When you were just recently, or as a kid? No, as, as a kid, I, as I've a kid. I've been into comics for a while. Which, when I was a kid, it wasn't like specific titles I was interested. In. It was more like just the novelty nicheness of comics. When I started like seeking and searching for a specific title or whatever, that was when I was in like high school. Whenever I was searching for a specific Batman book or searching for uh, a specific. Uh, Hawkeye book or, or whatever it was like that's when I got serious with it but I've kind of always been a lover of comics even whenever like I remember at Christmas asking my parents this is when I was really young I couldn't pick the books and know what I wanted but I asked my parents I was like can you get me comics for Christmas and like uh I, I'm thankful they did get me comics but they they came with a bunch of comics most of them were like dollar bin comics. Um, and it was like random stuff. It was like Robotech, uh, DP7, which was like a random <laughs> Marvel title. Uh, no number ones or anything. So I'm jumping into the middle or, or of whatever story is going in these. But, uh, yeah. but I still enjoyed it back then. So who's your favorite? Okay, well, let's just say. What's your favorite comic book character all the time? Uh, when I was a teenager, I would say Batman. Mm -hmm. I, I think Batman's a perfect teenager favorite character. And if, uh, as you're growing up, if you like Batman as your favorite, there's no problem with that. I think as I got older, I loved and appreciated Superman a lot more. I think uh, Superman is my favorite today. There, there's just a lot more I like about him, uh, a lot more I can relate with him, uh, just just like uh, uh, philosophy-wise, like his, his way of life, his way of thinking, uh, hope, all this stuff. Like I, I connect more with Superman nowadays than I do Batman, but I still love, love Batman comics and stuff. Yeah, I know, like, Superman for me is one of those characters I didn't like to begin with. I was always a Batman person. It was probably about a couple of years back when I finally read All-Star Superman. Is when I'm like, I get it. So, um, and, so and that, it was one of those oh, things when I was like, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. No delay. <laughs> oh, I, I was saying, yeah, it was one of those things where I was a teenager and I would look at Superman comics and stuff like that. And I was just like, ah, oh, this guy is lame. He's like such a boy scout. Like he just plays by the rules, all this stuff. And so that's why when I was younger, I didn't really appreciate Superman that much. But as I got older, I liked him a lot more. So would you say you're currently reading Superman or picking up? The so recent that's the thing is I haven't picked up, but, but with <laughs> Superman, I, I just always had that, that love now that I'm older for him. And, and there's been a ton of like 
recent books and past books that have like given more life to that love. But with your question about am I picking up like Superman stuff now or any comics now, I'm not picking up floppies right now. Uh, last time I picked floppies was during the future state stuff. I'm not saying future state is what like killed me from buying floppies. Uh, I guess kind of, but not for story reason wise. It was more the cost wise. Uh, yeah. Floppies got, I mean, they've always been pricey, but I was getting so sucked into it buying like, like at least five books a week, which to some people that's like five books a week. That's not a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, the cost stacked up to where at the moment I'm not buying floppies. I still pick up trades though. I still buy trades for stuff I'm really interested in. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know if it's any good or anything like that. I am looking forward to reading the whole war world stuff going on with Superman right now. That kind of interests me. So maybe it stinks. Maybe it's good. I'll, I'll find out. I've been hearing great things about it. I've been reading some of Cal L instead. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I've been yeah. great things. So, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so before we go into the Kickstarter, uh, I'd like to ask this question, uh, Marvel, DC or Indies, if you had to pick one, what's your favorite books to read? And, and I like to, to think about this. This sounds like a more doom and gloom interpretation mm -hmm. of the question, but I like to think of it of, if one can stay, if one has to stay for me, which would it be? I know that's not the question. I, for some reason, have to go <laughs> doom and gloom. Uh, but I'd probably say indies. I think, like, uh, I, I do love Marvel. I do love DC. But indies are just so good. As well as, like, when I'm trying to connect with someone or trying to get them into comics, like, Indies is usually the best route to go. Like with Indies, I, I always say, not even just talking about Marvel and DC, with just Indies, there is a comic for literally anyone out there. There's at least yeah. one that, that you will like. Like even if you don't read comics. Um, I, I've gotten a lot of enjoyment out of Indies. Plus, I like Indies. This is like one reason for there's an end point like sure some indie runs like the walking dead will go 193 issues mm -hmm. it's a lot but there was an end point whereas there's other stuff like uh I'm trying to think of something for example right now um basket full of heads oh no that's a dc thing that's dc <laughs> never mind yeah never mind uh, uh, Oblivion the song just came to an end. It's coming to an end. How many issues is that? Uh, geez, I want to say 36, 37, around there. Oh, so. Okay, so so yeah, stuff like that, as well as like a, a Descender and Ascender yeah. with Jeff Lemire. Like it, the whole, both of those titles, 50 issues, it, it's done. I still need to read Ascender. Um, but yeah, I, I just love that there is a finish line not that there's anything wrong with like just let's keep going let's keep going because this is printing us money there's there's not anything wrong with that because there can be good books out of that like there can be good run like i love uh james tinney and the fourth's detective comics run during the rebirth era like i loved that run and it did have an end he had a last issue in and then it just keeps going if you want to keep reading or you can say that's the end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just like that that definite end that's there. It just okay. Let's just dive into the Kickstarter. Uh, so I read the first issue after you sent it to me, and I was laughing my ass off. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, but you, for those you. who haven't read it, uh, do you want to do the trailer now, or do you want to introduce the story and then do the trailer? Uh, I can give a little synopsis and then we can jump in the trailer. Okay. Like a, a, a brief synopsis, I would say, of The Gallows Man, the series as a whole, would be this is a series that's set in the 1940s. 
It's a a satirically and over the top campy world. And within this campy world, there are some superheroes. Uh, the one that we follow is the Gallows Man, and he has a team around him. And the Gallows Man and his team, they have to stop a Nazi threat from infiltrating their city. They, they have to stop this. They must stop this, not only to save the city, but to uh, of the Gallows Man's former mentor. And that's basically a general gist. Own wise, a good way to put it is take the 1960s Batman show and throw in some Tarantino little violence, and that's your tone of the book, basically. Mm -hmm. Do we want to talk about issue one a little bit? Like, because some of the events that happened in issue one? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So, so a maid. I was going to say, you oh, mentioned sorry, Tarantino. Oh, so you mentioned Tarantino, and. There's a scene in the book that instantly reminds me of Tarantino, and it is with Sparkle. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's definitely uh, some some. I I didn't even think about that until now. With the uh, listener, you're going to get spoiled a little bit with <laughs> this trailer that that you're fixing to see. But I did that on purpose because. It's not, it's a flashback within issue one. Mm -hmm. As the trailer will tell you, can't spoil, it's a flashback. It, it, it's not in the, the, the central uh, time plot. Uh, but yeah, in that scenario, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's kind of similar to the baseball bat scene in mm -hmm. Inglorious Bastards. That's, that's a, yeah, I didn't think about that. Wow. So uh, uh, I have a uh, associate degree in filmmaking, so like Tarantino's the reason why I went into film. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, um, anything you want to add before the trailer? Um, ultimately, uh, this gives you a a a good feel of what the book will be like. This trailer. Um, there is some comedic stuff with the trailer because I don't like to just do a regular trailer. I like to, I like writing. So if I'm writing, I want the trailer to be enjoyable as well. Um, and I like writing comedy. So maybe the comedy hits or miss for you for the trailer, but watch this trailer. And if you're still iffy about it, once the Kickstarter is out, uh, Look at the Kickstarter page. See if this is your thing. <laughs> I think that's a good way to pull it. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, we're gonna watch this trailer real quick. It's about it's like two minutes long, right? A little less. Than yeah, that. yeah, it's a little less yeah. than two minutes. All right. Well, I hope everyone enjoys the trailer. Ready for the epic tales of town city superheroes to continue? Me neither, but this trailer is for the second issue of The Gallows Man, so I guess I must go on. Follow The Gallows Man and his team as they struggle to get closer to the Nazi threat that took the life of The Gallows Man's former mentor. And it is note, go back to issue one. That was some seriously brutal stuff. I mean, geez, Louise, the man's head was squashed like a tomato. Also, it was a flashback. I cannot spoil the past, silly listener. Will the Gallows Man and his team stop the Nazi cult hidden within the town city before it's too late? Find out by backing the second issue of the Gallows Man today over on Kickstarter. A second issue? Now that's surprising. I can't believe they had me reading for this book again. If only I could live out my life by doing voiceover work I yearn for and say things like, Yo mama so fat when she sits around the house, she sits around the house. Ooh, ooh. England is my city. Beep, boop, boop, bop. Boop, boop, beep. Music peaked with the creation of Ska. If I could say all of those things, 
Only then would I finally reach Nirvana. So yeah, there's there's a feel there. If it's still not for you after watching that trailer, you can read through some pages on the, the Kickstarter campaign itself. Okay, I gotta ask, did you do the voiceover work for that? No, no, no. I oh. wish. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if I could do that voiceover work, I'd be doing exactly what this guy was doing. It was a guy I I I use I, I hired him for the first Kickstarter campaign back last year. And it was like so good. He went above and beyond what I was expecting to where I was like, I have to get him to to do mm-hmm. the second trailer. And then once once Gallows Man number three comes around, hopefully he's he's still doing voice voiceover work because I'll probably get him again. I'm just like, hey, can you record all these lines before you're done? <laughs> <laughs> what what's so great is like he's He's a professional, and yet he's willing to say the dumbest stuff that <laughs> I write. Because because part of the reason, like that last bit where it, it's kind of a cut and you hear him say stupid stuff, that is a thing from the first trailer. We got him to say a lot more stupid stuff, like me, mow, moo, mow, I am a cow, like random stuff. Because it was ultimately me and my buddy Tio on that first trailer uh, from store brand comics to you, uh, we, I kind of like, Hey, I need me and you let's think of stuff that a 1940s radio announcer, stupid stuff that you would just love to hear one of them say that they have probably never said. And so we just were thinking of those ideas and that's, that's what happened in the first trailer. And in this trailer, I wanted a little bit, a little bit more of that. We didn't do as much as the first trailer, but got a little bit of it. And I'm just, I'm happy this guy is willing to put up with my crap. <laughs> do you know he reminds me of a DJ Baylor who did Batman: Brave and the Bold, his delivery. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I could definitely see that. Yeah, I had to ask that. But I had to ask it was you when I first heard it. I'm like, that's one of the questions that's going to be asked. <laughs> Um, Dude, I, I wish I could do that. So, just out of curiosity, how did the story come about? Like, what influenced you to do the story? Well, hold on. There's a little bit of a delay. Okay, there we go. So, you had asked what influenced me to, to make the story? So, yeah, like, how did, the, how did it come into your head? It wasn't just something that was sitting there the entire time. Uh... It was kind of uh, a few things. Like I've never watched the, I've never watched a lot of the 1960s Batman show. When I wrote the first uh, script, like the whole script, because it was originally a screenplay. Like I wrote this as a screenplay, um, and then over time I converted it uh, for a comic. But when I was writing it, I was kind of just thinking because this was like height of superhero stuff. When I was writing it, it was around. Late 2017, I think, is when I wrote the first draft of The Gallows Man. And so superhero stuff was big and all this stuff. I was wanting to do something that, like, at least me, I haven't seen with superhero stuff. And at that time, because I was writing a screenplay, I was like, I want to see something I haven't seen in these superhero movies. Like this dumb, fun, uh, maybe you can get a little... uh, satirical commentary out about how we uh, have desensitized ourselves to violence or just have it for fun, whatever you want to read into it. Um, But it it kind of started from that thinking. And then I was thinking like, well, some of the funnest or, or not funnest, but like easy moments in comics were kind of the gold and silver age of comics. It was just more, relaxed fun time reading sort of stuff so i was like okay i kind of want that tone of it and it was ultimately like wanting that as well as having the the candy i had seen again didn't see uh the batman 1960s 1960s show at that time 
literally all I knew was like the meme of him running with the bomb over his head, stuff like that. But I knew it was a campy show. It was a fun show. It's like, I want that. And I love film. I, I love, I should say, I love watching movies. There's a difference there. Creating is uh, a lot different. <laughs> exactly. There, there's, there's a lot, there's a bigger difference uh, when it comes to actually creating. Would I love to create film? Sure. But I, I have no, I don't have a lot of background and knowledge into that. So, but I've always loved watching movies. And yeah, like you were talking about with Quint, Quentin Tarantino, he was, is one of my favorite directors. I love pretty much all his movies. And with that, as well as like a bunch of B movies, because I like certain B movies, they have over the top violence and gore and stuff. I was like, what if? Because with the Adam West show, whenever they go for a punch, before the punch connected, it had the bam. Or at the uh -huh. pow, you never really saw any of the the violence actually connect. You see them about to commit violence, you don't see it connect though. And I was like, what if you took that out a little bit? Or you can still use that, but you show the aftermath of it. A bloodied nose, a broken neck, all of this stuff. The Eyes Tarantino level off. violence. There. And so that's basically where it came from. So um, I have to ask, what's your favorite Tino Tino movie then? So I was thinking about this recently. At the moment, because with Tarantino movies, at least for me, it fluctuates. Like, which is my favorite? At the moment, I'd say it's between Pulp Fiction and Kill Bill Volume 1. Oh. I'd say it's between those two. I do like Kill Bill, Kill Bill Volume 2, but Kill Bill Volume 1, it's like nonstop with the pace, as well as like just amazing action. Like soundtrack. one of the best action movies out there. One of the best soundtracks out there. I mean, it's, it's great, but I, I might put Pulp Fiction just a tiny peg above it but i still love all of his movies even the ones where people are like they either underappreciate it or put it at the bottom of their list like for example like jackie brown used to be like low on my You're list but now it, it's <laughs> yeah now now it's floated back up on my list because i saw it a couple years ago again i was like oh my gosh like i did not appreciate this enough oh. yeah um while well, reading the first issue, I kept going back to Inglorious Bastards. I kind of felt like there was a simple, like almost a tie to that. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, you you answered one of the questions I was going to ask is if you if you do have like uh, a love for Batman sixty six, like is there a love for that after this? Have you gone back to it? So, well, after I I wrote the first draft and after I then completed the screenplay uh, uh, final draft and then converted it into a comic. After all that, I finally sat down and watched two or three episodes of Batman 66, and I loved it. I loved it a lot. The thing is, I don't want to watch too much of it for it to subconsciously affect... Because this miniseries, Gallows Man right here is a four issue miniseries, but there is a potential for a sequel miniseries or a anthology miniseries afterwards that, that focuses on characters within town city and stuff. <laughs> There's potential for those after this. Okay. Well, well I, I can basically like start from what I was talking about. Essentially. Uh, what, what were we talking about? I'm so sorry. I asked, uh, if you still have a love for uh, Batman 66. And you said you watched the first two of oh. those three episodes. Yeah, I, I watched the first two or three episodes after I finished the the first, or finished the writing The Gallows Man and all that stuff. And I loved watching those two or three episodes that I watched. They were really great. But I don't want that show to subconsciously affect my writing of the gallows man world because 
it's a four issue mini series right here. The Gallows Man will be a four issue mini series, but there is potential for a sequel mini series as well as potential for an anthology mini series that takes place within Town City. So I don't want to. I, I want. Here's what I should say. I want to watch Batman 66 a lot. It's right up my alley. I love the humor with it. But subconsciously, I know it will affect me writing The Gallows Man. And I don't want to just straight up rip off Batman 66. No, I was going to... Once you finish The Gallows Man, just go back and watch all 100 episodes of it. No, I, I I definitely will. Like, at the very least, as soon as those scripts are done, not even the comics, when those scripts are done, putting it in the done pile and binging all of Batman 66. Because I do want to watch it. I will say it's difficult to binge. <laughs> like, you do have to okay, take a break. Okay. Every now and then. I might um, do I might do like one one or two episodes a night, like like yeah. a good a good nightcap. Actually, well, you know, same bat channel, same bat time. It does get you hooked, so you want to finish that storyline sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so getting off the Batman sixty six train, I I will say this though: while, while reading Gallows Man, I had Adam West's voice in my head as uh, the main character. I don't know why; I just kept reading his voice, uh, even I, before I like he that, that, Yeah. I, I like that people have like voices in their head, like other actors or whatever it may be, voices in their head from the characters. Cause like when I was writing it, like I had specific voices in my mind. Like uh the the one that was going through my mind the most, not saying reader that this should affect how you read the gallows man, but I was thinking like uh I forgot the actor's name, but the guy who played the tick. Uh, like that type of voice, kind of the big bowling voice. Uh, the guy at St. Page Crunk, Nipples in a Groove, yeah, 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 like, like something like that, or or something like uh, because a lot of Gallows Man's dialogue is like that. An actor who is just good at doing the hello, citizen, it is me, yeah, like that sort of stuff. Like, he, he's very expressive in his superhero persona. Um, yeah, that, and then when reading Major Swastika, who's the, the main villain of it all, you'll notice that there's weird speech impediment stuff with him. What I was going for with there, and this is going to sound weird, maybe listener, you might not be able to do this in your head. Cause I tried talking to someone about this. They're like, I can't, I, I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know that sound. But essentially, I was going for like a like a German Nazi accent mixed in with the Elmer Fudd voice, like the Elmer Fudd <laughs> speech impediment. So that's basically the melding of that voice, kind of. It when you're reading it, it does you can catch on to that. I'll admit that. I mean, I, I had that very strong Nazi accent. But then the speech impediment, I was catching on to as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, also, if you do, uh, is there anything else you're going to do? I mean, probably there's a spoiler if you do, but with Sparkle, are we going to ever go back to that? Uh, Gallows Boy and Sparkle? So. so, not to spoil anything, but the, the stuff going on with Sparkle... Uh, what happened to the sparkle and everything, all of that. Not to spoil anything, but I will say there's stuff, big stuff brought up with that at the very end of issue four. What I mean by the very end of issue four, I mean, after the story's over, after you read the letters pages, there's a post credit little page scene a few pages that will happen there that gotcha. kind of touches on that some. Yeah, I was I was really intrigued by that story, Lark. I'm like, kinda wanna know more about this character. So yeah, um yeah. so what was the reaction to issue one and how that influenced uh, issue two? I honestly 
when it comes to writing, like I wrote it all at, at once at and once. then, uh, and then like kind of split it up into what would be perfect for one issue and what's a good end point. And then what's a good start point for issue two, good end point for issue two and so on with the other issues. But when it comes to, uh, the success with the first Kickstarter, as well as, um, the the love for the gallows man comic it's kind of surreal for me because i i literally had someone a month ago and this this isn't me trying to like up my ego or anything when this person sent this this message to me i had to check my ego because when (laughs) i heard it 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 definitely boosted that ego up person sent me saying uh can't wait for the the issue two kickstarter just got done reading the first issue the fifth time and absolutely loved it. I was like, you read, I I, I didn't say this, but I was just thinking in my head, I was like, you read the gallows man five times. (laughs) Like, like you're reading it. You're reading it pretty much as much as I did when editing it. Cause when Mm -hmm. editing it, like I, I love this story, but when editing it and you having to read it over and over again to make sure everything's good by that fifth or sixth time when you're editing it, you're just like, ah, oh, am I Guys, done? Just, yeah. Am I, <laughs> am oh. I done reading this? <laughs> it's like editing a video, editing a film. We've seen it so many times. Yes, yes so. exactly. Yeah. Um, Actually, before this, I did watch your interview with Big Herm that you did last year for the first uh, issue. And you mentioned how much difference it is between writing a screenplay and writing a comic. And you mentioned now that this was a screenplay at first. Did you ever have to go yeah. back to it and fix anything to make it like a comic book? There, there was a decent bit of editing I had to do. But when it comes to the story not a lot of changes that had to be made. Um, I, I had to break up. I had to edit some stuff for what would be a good end point for issues, a good start point for issues, different stuff like that. But surprisingly, a lot of it fit well to where when I reached out uh, to the artist that's working on the book, Helen Bolton, uh, we have a, a great, a great friendship and and working on these books and stuff. We worked on some horror stuff before the, okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Now I was blurry. I'm so sorry, man. (laughs) Oh, okay. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, but, but with working with Helen, when I sent her that initial script, cause, cause I asked her, would she be interested in this idea? I, I pitched the concept to her and everything. She was like, yeah, sounds good. Send me the some pages from the script and, and we can go from there. I sent her the script and like uh, she she read the first few pages and then sent back some uh, some uh, concepts for those pages that I hired her for. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you like envision this perfectly. Like, it, it's amazing how much do you, you envision this and and. she's amazing at just doing the script and and with Helen, with uh, Helen Bolton, the artist of this book, she's just amazing at turning the script to page. And, and a lot of times how it is, we just can portray this world a lot better than you envision. Hmm. Like, like you have a thought in your head when you're writing, you have an image in your head of what it looks like. And then once you see that art actually come in, once you see it on page, you're like, holy cow, that's a lot better than what I was thinking. Because it is ultimately that that collaboration. You're working with someone there. Um, and yeah, we, like she is one of the best artists I've worked with. I, I won't say the best. I personally think she's the best artist I've worked with. <laughs> don't be that ego i I, I don't i don't want to step on like anyone's toes i all of the artists i've worked with i've loved working with them but she just like gets it It, it's so crazy 
because I, I have descriptions in the script and all this stuff, but but I, it's understandable for someone to be like, they do a rough and then I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. That's not really what I was thinking there. But Helen like gets it and just makes it better to where we usually, I usually send edits via email and rarely do I have to send any major edits. It's, it's rarely that a major edit is ever sent. It's always little stuff like, uh, uh, that, that little thing in the background, can you make it a darker color? It's the tiniest stuff. She's amazing at oh, this book. So she's coloring it as well. Yes, she she does all the art for it. She nice. she even letters the book. Like she is, she's a master at this stuff, in my opinion. I was actually going to ask you about the artist, but uh, <laughs> um, so when does the Kickstarter go live? So it goes live May third at eleven a.m. Central Standard Time. Okay. So. Uh, I know I had to do this. Other people are probably a lot smarter than me. If you aren't living in Central Standard Time, go to Google, type in 11 a.m. Central Standard Time converted to your time zone is. And yeah. that's when it will go live for you. Yeah, you just flip it around basically sometimes too. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. exactly. So uh, what are the tiers for the Kickstarter? Oh, I'm sorry. The The question you just asked, uh, it cut out some. Oh, so uh, what are the tiers for the Kickstarter? So there's 12 to 13 tiers within the Kickstarter. Uh, the tiers range from $1 to $70. Really whatever you're comfortable uh, uh, both in, in backing as well as financially. Uh, every little bit helps this, this campaign. Um, digital copies start at five dollars. You can get uh, both issue one and two digital copies for eight dollars, and then physical copies they start at ten dollars. Um, and and I, I I I recommend a ton of the high priced uh, reward tiers as well, but I always have to think in like great value and bargain route. Um, there's two tiers that are great bang for your buck one is a 25 dollar tier it's called the great value tier where it comes with a signed copy of the the first or sorry signed copy of the second issue like if you've already read the first issue have the first issue signed copy of the second issue the first cover signed copy of the second issue the second cover um the second issue sticker set like there's i uh, I'll show you the first issue sticker set, like just little stuff like that, which the stickers are very high quality. They're a lot better than I thought they would have been whenever I got them back from the printer. And then this was a, uh, I see you've started your morning duties already. That's from Good issue job. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there there's going to, it's not going to be that sticker set. There's a issue two sticker set specifically for issue two so more stickers if you love stickers um and there's also it also comes with the pdf copies of issues one and two comes with uh the there's something i'm forgetting it comes with a a thank you through social media like we'll have a thank you post on social media um and there's a couple other things that for some reason i'm forgetting right now but then there's a $26 tier that is our catch-up bundle tier. Like if you haven't read issue one or two, that's something I should mention. All the tiers, if you've read issue one, there's a tier for you if you're just one in issue two. If you haven't read any of it, issue one or two, there's tiers for you. You can get both issues one and two. Um, this $26 tier, this uh, catch-up bundle basically, comes with issue one. Issue two, both signed, um, comes with PDF copies of both, comes with PDF copies of the the script, comes with uh, the sticker set, both issue one sticker set and issue two 
sticker set and a couple other things, but a lot of bang for your buck right there. And then going super far up, the highest tier is the $70 tier, basically. And it's a metal cover of issue one. It's not just that. It's a bunch of stuff, but that's the the big thing within that. And I'm actually pulling it up right now just so I don't sound like an idiot and know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but but with this metal cover tier, basically, it's a variant cover of issue one. And the cover is like literally metal. Like I, I got this idea from DP Brown, Dog Pound Brown. Mm-hmm. He did this with his uh, his theme of thieves book. And I saw the video of him unboxing and stuff. I was like, that actually looks really cool because I could go foil cover. I could go holographic cover, all this stuff. But I saw that metal cover. I was like, that's pretty dope. Mm-hmm. I do like the metal cover. I haven't seen that before. So I, I decided to go with that. And <clears throat> basically, there's not going to be more than 25 of these of this variant made. So it's going to be super rare for, for those ultra collectors out there. There's going to be a super rare uh, copy of issue one of the Gallows Man, super rare variant of it. Um, 25 in existence, no more than that ever. Um, and that'll be signed by me. You'll also get uh, a signed copy of the Gallows Man number two. That won't be metal cover. It's just issue one. That'll be metal cover. Uh, you get the sticker set from issue two. You get PDF copies of both. You get PDF copies of both uh, issue one and issue two scripts. And with all tiers, you get a thank you. Uh, your name is added to the thank you post whenever we thank all the backers on social media. But those are just some some hints and some flavors of some of the tiers we got going. Like I mentioned, there's 12 to 13 tiers. There's a tier for anyone. Like I mentioned before, with there's a comic for any and everyone there's a tier for the gallows man kickstarter for any and everyone including retailers there's retailer bundles and all that stuff well i actually i have close relationships with a a retailer so i might talk to them and maybe get the book and shot for you so awesome thank you yeah Uh, yeah just simply like bringing it up to them mm -hmm. is is amazing thank you yeah uh well my girlfriend's assistant manager she's assistant manager at comic shop in town so I got the connection. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, but yeah, to be honest with you, 70 bucks for the uh, the highest tier, that's still kind of a value. That's still kind of cheap, opposed to other ones I've seen. So Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, like, yes, it makes sense to find ways to get, like, a $150 tier or a $300 tier or up and up so mm-hmm. you can have this giant kickstarter that makes thousands and stuff there's nothing wrong with that but for me it's like i i don't want to like i want all of this stuff to feel valuable to people like i don't want it to just feel like a gimmick or anything like that and i i want to be able to deliver on the the reward tiers and stuff that i offer and and all the ones that i offer i 100 percent know i can easily get it to the backers kind of like the image comics mindset so yeah yeah so i'll uh, go with that yeah yeah kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier about how expensive floppies have become so yeah because because that's that's ultimately a thing is like if you can't get a physical copy like there's there's a lot of people that are interested in the gallows man but they don't live in the united states and so a physical copy is going to cost a lot because shipping is stupid. Insane. It's outrageous. <laughs> um, so I completely get not getting a physical copy if you live in another country outside the United States. But there's PDF copies. And like I mentioned before, issues one and two, $8. And and something I, I forgot to mention for anyone that doesn't know the Gallows Man, a huge bang for your buck because the first issue – just story alone is 49 pages. There's also a bunch of extras and behind the scenes stuff that you can see. But story alone, 49 pages. In issue two, there's 47 pages just story alone. 
which I guess technically you could say 49 pages because there's a two page little comic dealing with Newsboy after the behind the scenes stuff. So 49, 49, I mean, you're getting almost a hundred pages worth of story, including a bunch of little extra stuff within there. So $8 for nearly a hundred pages of story to me doesn't sound bad. That that's what I love when I'm picking comics. What's the best bang for my buck, basically? I have the last Ronin, the T uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue yeah. right next to me. That is nine dollars, and that's forty pages. So, <laughs> oh wow! If that's any indication, which which, oh. which I was about to say, they they can charge that just yeah. from the name alone, and they have that team back. So, pe people are going, they're going to and willing to pay that. So. Except when you have a discount, then it's nice. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. you oh. got the connection. Yeah. Um, so before we go off off air, um, you have had issue one was successfully backed. So any advice that you would give uh, anybody going into Kickstarters to back it, to get it backed? Uh, yeah, I, I'll try not to ramble on too much with this one, but I have a decent bit of knowledge with this. Not as much as a lot of people because I'm not making a, like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands off my comic book on Kickstarter. But I know what not to do at least because I'm willing to admit I had a, a Kickstarter. My very first Kickstarter was for the first issue of Disney Avenue, which again, Though there will be a Kickstarter that will come back for that. It'll be <laughs> Disney Avenue one and Disney Avenue number two. And I know what I'm doing with Kickstarter now. So I, I've got this one. But that that was like such a like at the time, like just a, a punch to the gut, like a Kickstarter film, especially your first one. But the ultimate thing with that is like if your Kickstarter fails or if you go you have those major hangups or whatever it is, keep going. Like, don't quit. Don't be like, ah, this Kickstarter failed for this book I'm working on. I'm out of the comic game. I'm not making comics anymore. I'm not doing Kickstarter anymore. I'm done. Don't have that mindset. I, for a tiny period after that issue, I'll admit, I did have a little bit of that mindset, not of like, I'm quitting comics, but I did have the thought of like, okay, well, where am I going to go? What am I going to do with my comments? But I, I talked with some people and they're like, you, you just need to, to beef up more on your, your reaching out and your marketing. Cause I'm not the best at PR. I'm not the best at marketing, but you, you do need to get somewhat better at it. Some tips that I'll give people who, haven't done a Kickstarter before, or maybe you've had a failed Kickstarter or whatever. Uh, major stuff is be sure you stay in contact with, with people that are interested in comics, like friends or family. Be willing to reach out to them about your Kickstarter happening. Uh, be sure to reach out to people on Instagram or, or whatever. Uh, a while before your your Kickstarter launches. That's a big thing. Planning. That's again, I ramble a lot. Planning is a major thing. Don't think that, okay, I just did my Kickstarter page. Like I've got the pre page up and next week I will launch the, the campaign. I, I basically, I've done no promotion or anything like that to anyone to any fans or friends or family or anything like that. I've done no promotion, but the pre-launch page is up and one week I will launch. You cannot do that much screaming at the top of your voice in one week. Oh. It doesn't work that way. You need to start planning this stuff months ahead. It, I'd say at least two months ahead, but it's good to plan even further back. Um, like I mentioned before, reaching out to people, reaching out to reviewers. Because that's one thing, like, uh, this was ultimately a joke, and I still love the joke. But with issue one, I didn't have anyone at that time review the comic. So 
basically what you see there, it says, well, I can say it is a comic book, <laughs> Grant Morrison. Not that one. It isn't that Grant Morrison. It's someone I found on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, it says, boy, do I feel sorry for whoever had to raise that so-called writer. It says the writer's mom, that one. <laughs> it's ultimately a joke. It's yeah. funny. But, but part of the hidden truth in that is like, I didn't have anyone uh, review it at the time of me uh, uh, getting all the pages and stuff done to where those jokes were in the campaign of the first Kickstarter, which probably good humor for people and stuff like that. But I do have actual reviews in the second Kickstarter. I, I, I pulled some reviews from people that reviewed it. And I don't know, it, it just it helped for me, at least. To, to see that people liked it, or even if some people didn't like it. I like constructive criticism. It, it helps you, it helps make you better, helps you be a better creator. But major thing is plan ahead. Also, consider, you don't have to do this, consider doing like Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, from what I've seen, with the couple of Kickstarters I've run, you don't really need to do ads before it launches. Start the ad as soon as it launches. Um, what I'm going to do this time, which this might be a, a trial and error thing, we'll see. I'll run an ad probably the first 72 hours and I'll, I'll dump a certain amount of money, like a, a I say a large amount. I'm not going to dump more than $30. That sounds large to me. $30 on a three-day ad? But it, it reaches a lot more people based on the money you put in mm -hmm. per day. So that's something to consider with your advertisement. Uh, something I wouldn't recommend, or at least do a lot of homework on if you do this. Um, luckily, I never made the mistake of this is when you're making a Kickstarter, you will get reached out to a bunch of PR companies or, or marketing companies and stuff. Um, a lot of those are fake, or if they're not fake, they can't help you that much, and you're likely just wasting 20 to $100. You can do better marketing on your own than most of those marketing companies can. You just have to put the put the work in, you got to put the effort in. There's a lot of time that goes into it. But if you're willing to put that time into it, if you're willing to put in those hours of, of promoting, constantly posting on Instagram, talking with family and friends, talking with, with comic Facebook groups, that's another YouTubers. thing, join comic Facebook group, YouTubers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Reach out to YouTubers. There's like, like Nog. In like he I, I'm, I'm grateful that he brought me on the channel this is just an example of being able to spread more word about your comment uh -huh. there's so many opportunities you just have to look for them you have to find them you you don't need to wait last minute to do it because we all have our own lives you have to schedule this other people have to schedule it you just got to put in the time and effort and you need to start kind of early on it I mean, best examples, look at you and I. We were in conversation almost a month ago about this. So, yeah, yeah. It takes time. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So, do you have, uh, after helping people with Kickstarters now, do you have any final rows to convince people to back the Kickstarter? Any last words to get them to put that one to $70 into it? <laughs> so, Ultimately, you need to remember the, the radio host line within the Gallows Man itself. It starts out, and spoiler alert, it will end in issue four. It'll, it'll have the radio announcer talking as well. It's something to keep in mind with the Gallows Man. It's not as you scum, feel despair, for the Gallows Man is everywhere. And I say that because viewer... If you've paid attention, the gallows man is everywhere. He's up there. He's up there. It's the variant copy. He is everywhere. He's behind us. So, he's <laughs> oh. behind us. 
he likely viewer, he is behind you. The gallows man is everywhere. The gallows man would love for you to support this book, to read this book, to give it a chance. Uh, if, if you don't like it, that's understandable. But if, if you chuckle at it, if you find humor in it, whatever it may be, if you have a fun time with it, because that's ultimately what I want with this book is just have a fun time, get a few laughs. That's that's something we need now more than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, there There's nothing against modern uh, comic books, and there are comedic comic books out there, but the past 10 to 15 years, years our comics have been very and especially with stuff like new 52 they've been very dark it's okay to have fun adult comic books because ultimately this is rated m for mature there's no uh suggestive themes there's no sexual stuff going on there's no there's no drinking there's no smoking it's rated m for the violence and gore so that's that's the reason it's rated m but I mean, it's just a fun time. We need we need some levity in our comics sometimes. All right. So, uh, where can they find you uh, on social media? So yeah, with social media, uh, if you want to follow more with me and comic creating, whether it's the Gallows Man or upcoming projects like Disney Avenue, um, you can follow me. I guess the, the function is follow on Instagram and follow me on Instagram, like, or follow me on Facebook at Disney comics. That's D I S M A Y comics, not Disney comics, <laughs> Disney comics. Um, yeah. You can follow along with that. See the journey, uh, see my thoughts on movies sometimes. Cause sometimes I like to randomly post in the stories about that. Um, and, and you can also check out if you want to get more into my idiotic stupid brain uh you can check out the store brand comics podcast me and tio again we we have discussions about comic stuff we discuss sometimes not purposely philosophical stuff with comics or movies um and then the other half of the time we're pitching basically dream marvel stuff for us or dream dc stuff for us or just just random stuff like a Waldo and where in the world is Carmen San Diego crossover called uh, where's Carmen San Diego. I think is what it's called. We did that one over a year ago. It's a really good episode, but I forgot what it's called. So yeah. Um, and I'll have all the links to everything you just said in the description as well. Awesome. Um, one thing I was thinking about um, TikTok would be another good way of a Kickstarter. That, that ultimately is is something that I need to get more versed in because I'm I'm 24 like I'm you got six years rel relatively <laughs> relatively I'm a young guy I I, I teach uh, teenagers and a lot of times they're like you're such an old man hmm. but relatively I'm a, I'm a young guy but I still have like old tendencies even though i'm young like i i don't do snapchat like i never got into snapchat tiktok i i'll watch compilations here and there on youtube but i still haven't got into tiktok but even though i'm not in there and eventually i might still get in there because ultimately like like he's talking about it is a good tool for advertisement um for for pushing pushing your kickstarter or whatever it is that you have uh, your your channel or whatever it may be. Even if I'm not doing it, consider it, listener, who is a creator of a comic, creator of, of YouTube videos or whatever it may be. It is a good, useful tool for that advertisement. I mean, I would just say that you do have the comedic chops for YouTube, uh, TikTok. <laughs> so, but um, thank you for coming on to Noggin. Uh, I look forward to checking out issue two. Uh, I fell in love with issue one after reading it. So thank you, uh, man. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, I will be sharing this trailer to everyone I know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, 
But thanks for watching, and we'll see you at the comic shop. Take care.